I'm Steve Wilson from the Economic Growth Institute. Welcome to Understanding the Middle Skilled Workforce in Connected and Automated Vehicles. Um, the Economic Growth Institute is part of the University of Michigan. We're a tech-based economic development organization uh, focused on helping companies and communities. Um, one of our specialties is investigating nascent technologies, understanding them, uh, and then finding resources that are needed, required to make a positive economic impact with those technologies. And those resources are typically manufacturing processes, techniques, um, possible uh, and workforce skill sets. And so with that, um, in that same vein, we performed a study uh, for the American Center for Mobility uh, with the leaders of develop in the development of connected and automated vehicles. And some of those leaders are here today to share uh, that with you live. But uh, before we hear from them, uh, we have a special guest this morning uh, from the state of Michigan's new Office of Future Mobility and Electrification. Uh, he's joined us to say a few words. So without further ado, I'll give you, uh, I give you the state of Michigan's new Chief Mobility Officer, Trevor. Trevor Paul. Thanks. Thanks so much, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I apologize in advance for the cardinal that's really loud in my backyard and also the lawnmower. The other option is a crying baby inside. Um, so it's been one of those mornings. Um, I will be extremely brief, but I, I wanted to uh, quickly explain sort of my, my role, uh, what this new office is, and how it plans to support work like this. Um, and then just offer up um, you know, the opportunity to connect after this meeting, just to talk, um, just to sort of understand where, where you're at in, in terms of uh, Michigan's mobility narrative, what we still need to do, uh, what we're very good at, and what are some moonshots where if we put our, our heads together, we could achieve something special. Um, so the year 2030 is, is gonna be a big year uh, for a lot of reasons. EVs are expected to pass internal combustion engine vehicles by 2030. AVs are expected to take off in the late 2020s with 50% of production of all vehicles being partially autonomous. Uh, software will represent 50% of a, the value of a vehicle by 2030. Uh, and nationally, and this is from a, a Michigan Mobility Institute study, the mobility industry will need about 45,000 new people with computer-related engineering skills by 2030. Uh, Michigan will need about 12,000 of those people to retain a pole position as the global mobility leader. Um, so, the global shift towards autonomous and, and electric vehicles is driving a new era, uh, which is, is we're in right now, but will really begin to manifest itself in mass by 2030. And the governor uh, believes that the year 2030 is not something that, that future state officials just enter. It's something that today's officials um, create. And simply put, the, the year 2030 will belong to the state that prepares for it best. And that was sort of the impetus for this new state office, uh, future mobility and electrification. The governor's vision is that you can achieve a stronger state economy through safer, equitable, and environmentally sound transportation for Michigan residents. Um, and, and so with that, and this office has six core objectives. The first is to generate new investment and job creation from mobility focused companies. The second is to develop, further develop, I should say, systems uh, for deploying autonomous and shared transportation. So expanding Michigan's infrastructure lead. The third is establish Michigan as the premier state for young companies, mobility startups, to build, commercialize, and grow technologies that are redefining the field. The fourth is, is to help uh, support the transition from internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles, and with that, expand charging infrastructure. Uh, the fifth is to protect the state's competitiveness around mobility manufacturing, bolstering our, our manufacturing core, while also marking a path toward its evolution. And then the the last one, um, which is last but certainly not least, is support the efforts of uh, groups like ACM, Dawn, U of M, Steve, to develop and attract the skills and talent necessary to meet the changing demands of the mobility sector. Um, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but the definition of middle skill jobs uh, is, as far as I understand it uh, in reading the report, uh, they're jobs that require more skills and experience than a high school education provides, but less than a four-year degree. And that's where the majority of the CAV sector technicians right now 
are, are lumped together in this industry, redefining it, the ones that are tweaking the tests, um, setting up the deployments. And that's critical. Uh, it's absolutely critical. I mean, if, as a state, if we're, um, you know, setting up 500 miles of connected corridor, that's great, but who's going to be preparing the vehicles to run on them to begin to decrease the, you know, the number of crashes a year, the number of traffic fatalities a year. It's this group of people. And so that's why this study is so, so critical. And, and I can't think of a better team to have put it together than um, Steve and, and the University of Michigan. Uh, but then also uh, Don Thompson, who's an industry veteran who I, I've known since I've gotten in the game, um, it's, it's almost 10 years now. Uh, and, and she's been leading that effort for the American Center for Mobility. And um, they've really been at the forefront of, and I really appreciate this. It, you can't operate a testing environment in a vacuum. It takes people. And that's why they've paired extremely nicely this, this talents and workforce program that Dawn leads. Um, and, and this is just another great output from, from her and from that team. So I don't want to belabor the point. I'll just turn it over to Dawn and, and thank you again. And um, for those that uh, want to connect after to talk a bit more about the office and new mobility, Steve, if it's all right, if you're going to send up, send out follow-up, feel free to include my my number and my, my email and, and I can connect uh, with whoever. So thank you again, everybody and enjoy the show. Thank you, Trevor, very well said. Um, glad to have you here and thank you for your support. Again, my name is Dawn Thompson. I'm the Director of Strategy, Marketing and Programs at the American Center for Mobility. I'm a board member of the Square One Education Network and I'm on the advisory board of Michigan State University research program WEAVE, which is a continuation of ACM's research that we did with MSU a couple of years ago, focused on the implications of connected and automated vehicles and the trucking and shared mobility industries. Uh, first, thank you to the team of U of M uh, Economic Growth Institute for conducting thoughtful, rigorous research and assimilating the research into valuable insights and a report that provides clarity and usable data. It's very important. So thank you, Steve and Sarah and the team at, at U of M for your hard and insightful work. And thank you for pulling together this webinar uh, today so we can directly hear from these industry professionals, the weight and implications this study has on the important work they do in connected and automated vehicle development. I also wanna take a moment to thank the Ralph Wilson Foundation uh, who funded this research for their passion and support in making a difference in the middle skill workforce. Um, the American Center for Mobility quickly is balanced on three pillars, all of them for the purpose of accelerating the mobility industry, including testing and technology development, standards development, and education and workforce development. ACM stakeholders are very similar to the attendees of today's webinar, including state and regional government, and we're looking forward to working with Trevor Paul and his team. Industry investors, including Ford, Toyota, Subaru, Hyundai, Visteon, AT&T, Microsoft, Siemens, um, Intertech, and Deloitte. And we're very proud to have signed MOUs with 15 colleges and universities across the state of Michigan. We also work closely with other industry organizations aligning the region in industry and workforce, uh, workforce programming. Our measure of success is not just supporting this type of research, but also working hard to make a difference uh, in the mobility industry as a whole. ACM will use this data in collaboration with our stakeholders to identify and develop workforce programs. We'll soon be standing up our Industry Advisory Board Education Committee and aligning that with our academic consortium to ensure we continue to build the bridges that provide ongoing insights and alignment between industry and academia. We'll also work to leverage ACM's Smart Mobility Test Center as an education, education resource asset. And while the focus of this uh, report is on middle skills and connected and automated vehicles, and focused on testing and infrastructure specifically, uh, we at ACM see that the implications span across the entire education continuum from primary schools, secondary education, and through to lifelong learning uh, programs. Further, they implicate core skills outside of CAV and into other sectors of our workforce and other industries, focused on hard and soft skills needed to support technology advancement across the board. There are core skills that can be worked into primary education, certifications that students can graduate high school with, and programs that can be developed to build skills in the existing workforce to ensure employability long-term for those unemployed and underemployed. Our measure is our workforce and the industry's ability to um, ability and agility in scaling up teams with the right skills. So we have a lot of hard work 
ahead of us to collaborate with our stakeholders and build strong solutions together to turn these insights into action. If you're interested in learning more, um, please reach out to me at um, the American Center for Mobility, Education and Workforce Development Programs um, are underway and uh, we look forward to collaborating and working with uh, everyone in the region. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Sarah and uh, she can present the findings of the report. Thank you so much, Don. Really appreciate that. And to Steve and Trevor, really appreciate you all kicking this off this morning. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick so we can um, kind of dig into the research. I'm really excited to share um, what we found um, as we walked through this um, research and, and talking to different industry professionals. So just to kick off real quick, um, I want to couch our research within the broader mobility sector. So mobility being defined as the movement of people and goods, it's a very broad arena right now. Trevor has a huge job overseeing a lot of pieces of this. Um, and our study was a very specific area of the mobility space, which is the connected and automated vehicle sector or cab sector. And so within that, we wanted to understand the middle skill jobs that were related to either design, testing, or the infrastructure that supports these vehicles. And so when we look at those jobs within that cab sector, you know, these really boiled down to the technicians. These are the ones who comprise the majority of the middle skill jobs. So the focus of this report really ended up being about these individuals and the role that they play in this sector and this sector's growth. So to be able to get um, kind of our findings, the way we approached this was through interviews with 63 different participants um, representing 30 organizations. Many of these uh, interviews we actually did in person. Um, many organizations were very accommodating and having us come to their office or organization and sitting down with many individuals. I do have a quick chart here that kind of gives a brief overview of the breakdown of the different type of organizations we talked to. Um, and it was really a, a big um, array of OEMs, suppliers, industry. We had startups, infrastructure, and ecosystem. So these are more fully defined in the report, which I'll provide you a link to at the very end, but I just wanted to provide that overview so it has context for um, you know, where we pulled our findings from. Another thing I wanna overview quickly before we dive deeper is kind of the, the story that we heard over and over again. So kind of this big arc, which is within these middle skill jobs and the, and the technicians who are doing them, the technician job has changed drastically in the last 20 to 30 years. So this graphic kind of crudely represents that, but it shows that you know in the 90s, your technicians were really mechanically inclined. Um, they had a few electrical and electronic skills, but what we have heard over and over again um, from engineering managers and HR managers is how complex the skill sets are. It's not just about the mechanical skills and a few electrical and electronic, but it's a lot more complex and these skills are continuing to increase. So through this report, we'll go through more detail of what that looks like, but I wanted to give that overarching view first. Now to be able to understand um, the technician role and kind of what they're doing, we have two different sections to talk about. First is job duties, and job duties is in the middle um, of these circles. So I have four little circles, and the job duties that we found were prototyping, troubleshooting, testing, and maintenance. For the CAV technicians to be able to accomplish these successfully, they relied on technical skills and soft skills. And these um, create the outside of this circle because it's really through those skill sets that they are able to accomplish these job duties successfully. When we look at how the employers talked about these job duties, prototyping and troubleshooting were by far the uh, most common duties that uh, technicians were accomplishing. This was followed then by testing and maintenance. Um, and when we talk about maintenance, I don't mean like typical oil change type maintenance, so that may be in there. More often than not, this, this was about maintaining software or maintaining testing equipment, uh, but that was just one piece. Really the prototyping and troubleshooting were the most common job duties. I did put in here a quote from one of the engineering managers that really uh, emphasized kind of this point this individual shared, the technicians we hope could do an initial level one analysis of logs and say, that was a good run or that was a bad run, rather than just having to say, I captured something and then throwing it over the wall to somebody. 
This is the expectation we have today, and I think that expectation will just grow. And so this quote kind of alludes to the increasing complexity uh, for technician jobs and also the increasing responsibility that they're taking on in some of this initial level one analysis. Now, when we talk about accomplishing this well, this is done in teams. And so when you bring up teamwork, soft skills automatically start coming up. Um, you know, you see in here, uh, communication, task management, collaboration, these were skills that employers were talking about over and over again. Another one that came up very frequently was passion and interest. Um, the CAV sector is increasingly, uh, not increasingly, constantly evolving, right? <laughs> this is a developing field. And so employers really valued the technicians who had a natural interest in this field and the desire to continue to learn more and add to their skills because the skills are just going to continue to increase in complexity and learning new things as these vehicles continue to develop. And then problem solving is also a soft skill that came up repeatedly. I'm going to dive now into the technical skill sets that came up. I apologize for the very full um, slide that we have here, but there's a lot of information and I just want to breeze over it. So when we talk about technical skill sets, six key little blocks came out here. We have mechanical, electrical, electronic, then data related systems, software and systems. Um, again, in the report, you can read through these in more detail, but I just wanted to give the high level view of these are the six key areas that um, kind of the CAV technicians um, have some experience in. Now, this isn't every single individual has experience in these. This is just the array of skill sets that are needed within the CAV sector. When we look at what came up most frequently when employers were talking about their technicians, electrical and mechanical skills were still right at the top, um, always on the tip of the tongue. You know, those are constantly mentioned. Those were closely followed then by electronic and data related system skills and as well as systems and software skills. So this gives a picture of a very um, complex workforce, many skills that are needed. Um, and a lot of times right now we heard of employers putting together teams to be able to figure out how to address all of these different areas that are needed. But increasingly we're hearing terms such as mechatronics come up. Um, and mechatronics is that um, integration of electrical, mechanical, electronic, and some type of software or systems understanding as well. So um, we're really hearing more and more how employers are not wanting just one skill, not just electrical or not just mechanical, but do you understand how those integrate and how those inform each other? Can you work in one space and maybe also in another? And so to be able to capture this, we created um, another graphical representation of this and we see it as almost like a pyramid and that that's what you see now on your screen and at the bottom of this pyramid we call our base skills and so that's the mechanical electrical and electronic you know this is really the foundation for these technicians is they have to start there and and gain some of those skills but then on top of that um, we see these technicians are starting to build the enhanced skills and software and data related systems. And then finally, there's the emerging skill set um, and the overall systems understanding and how all these pieces kind of impact each other. When we look at how the employers talked about these, so what is what are they needing right now the most of if we kind of look at it in this little chart here on the right. Base skill sets still make up 60% of what they need. And then there's 27% um, of what they do is enhanced skills and 13% is in those emerging skills. So there's still strong foundation in the base skills. But what's really interesting is then when we look at where employers talked about gaps, we start to see um, kind of an increasing emphasis on enhanced skills. So here at the bottom, you can see Base skills, the gaps, you know, 40% of the time they're still talking about that base skill set. You know, they still really need people with mechanical, electrical, and or electronic skill sets. But those enhanced skills are right behind that. So that's the software and the data related systems. That's a growing area. Now, emerging and soft skills are kind of those icing on the cake still. Not quite as big of a gap yet, but also not quite big, as big of a need yet either. So what does that mean for what's happening currently versus the future? So I put the current here 2020 and when we ask employers, what do you see changing in the next three to five years? 
you know, you can see it, base skills goes down to 51%. And then enhanced skills becomes 32 and emerging skills become 17%. So you're really seeing the top of that pyramid growing in importance more and more. And when I translate that and put that into the pyramid, this is really how you see it playing out is that base skill set. Again, it's there. Um, you will see mechanical, that dark blue is relatively smaller compared to electrical and electronic, which just keeps growing more and more within the vehicle. And then that enhanced skill and emerging skills, that their portion of that pyramid just keeps growing bigger and bigger. The other piece I wanted to point out is that within systems, we also kind of snuck in there cyber and servers. Now, this isn't to say that technicians are going to become cybersecurity experts. No, not, not at all. We don't see that. But there needs to be an increasing awareness of how cybersecurity and um, updates to servers impacts the entire vehicle, which is it's part of a system's understanding. But it seems like that's going to continue to happen more and more as connected and automated components are just part of every piece of the vehicle. So what does this mean um, overall? I think first and foremost, what I wanna make sure I emphasize is the value of technicians in CAV testing design and infrastructure. These individuals are key to helping to facilitate new designs and effective troubleshooting and understanding this space. Um, engineering managers could not uh, say enough good things <laughs> about how critical skilled technicians are. Skilled technicians allowed engineers to do their job even better because they um, were able to build on what the technicians had given them as far as information or ideas, troubleshooting, things like that. So these technicians are really important in the evolution of the CAV sector within Michigan and the continued competitive, uh, competitiveness of this within a, the global environment. Additionally, um, I do want to highlight that the skill sets for these technicians are increasingly complex. As you can see from the triangle, you know, there's just more and more things that these technicians need to know. However, we don't necessarily see that this means um, additional formal schooling. It could, it could be. There are many schools um, who are currently incorporating mechatronics or in their programs, or they actually have mechatronics programs. But even within a two-year degree, it's going to be very difficult to get all of these skills. Um, and a, the potential solution for um, organizations such as ACM and other partners that they have are looking at how can they combine with formal learning environments, some type of experiential learning um, to address the enhanced and emerging skills, as these are going to continue to change and evolve as technology continues to change and evolve as well. So this is the brief overview of the research that we had. Um, we are going to have an extensive time here with our industry panelists. Um, I would encourage you, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, Parker Finn, who is the Assistant Director at the Economic Growth Institute, will be facilitating our time of Q&A and with our industry panelists. So I'm gonna go ahead and at this point, stop sharing my screen so we can begin to introduce our panelists and we can get going with that. Let me do that quickly. All right. Um, alrighty, so we're gonna kick off and I'm gonna invite uh, Paul, if you would like to go ahead and kick us off. Thank you, Sarah. Paul Bowser, Roush Industries. I've been in the industry about 26 years doing uh, vehicle development. I'm now a manager at over three facilities within our uh, Roush family. I've been involved with AVs and electrified vehicles here for about 10 years. I'm also an instructor at uh, Monroe County Community College, teaching automotive courses and working to develop AV and EV vehicle courses within our own company and instructing our own employees on the intricacies of this new industry. Thank you, Paul. Ben? Hi, good, afternoon. good morning. I'm Ben Gassman. I'm the senior manager of the test lab operations here in Nissan in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Um, we have about 107 employees in the test lab doing full vehicle development that comprises of technicians, engineers, and managers. Uh, my background, um, 26 years in, in production, and 
variety of industrial engineering, engine assembly, worked in quality operations, worked in the, the Leaf battery project for several years, but I moved to R&D from Tennessee, that's where the accent's coming from, uh, two years ago. And uh, it, it's great, uh, it's further upstream in the, the process of producing and designing and it just it's awesome you get to, to work with a lot of intelligent people it's more upstream it's definitely challenging but it, it's great and as far as my role in connected and automated vehicles um currently we have a team of one under my umbrella we have one technician he has electrical background he's supporting the autonomous drive program and testing and we have a little bit of our testing in japan we do a lot in arizona but here in farmington we're starting to expand that and we expect that to grow thanks ben patrick Oh, we can't hear you, Patrick. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Cripps. I'm also from uh, the Nissan Technical Center in uh, Farmington Hills, Michigan. Um, I've been in the automotive industry for uh, 20 years, um, all of it within the infotainment and the connected car um, area. Uh, most of my experience is in the infotainment area, but um, recently I moved to the connected car team um, it's a very small team within Nissan, but it is growing. Um, and um, so we, with the, um, the talk about technician uh, usage, in the infotainment area, we had a team of five technicians um, with some specialization in the Bluetooth, VR, voice recognition area, navigation area and such. Um, moving over to the connected car because it's such a young team, a, a small team. We do not have technicians, and uh, so this this talk of uh, technicians and the support in the connected car area is very interesting for me. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Marty? Yeah, it's Marty Beaker. Thanks for uh, being invited to this. I work uh, at Bosch, an automotive supplier, for 20 plus years. Uh, also working with Patrick over those years in the infotainment connectivity area for about 17 of those 20 plus. Uh, and I also recently switched. Uh, I'm in the driver assistance area. Uh, my focus now is uh, vehicle builds and vehicle uh, testing setups. Uh, previously in the infotainment area, I was uh, focusing on system testing. Um, during those years, uh, I worked with uh, uh, mentoring and uh, working with over 75 different engineering interns and technicians. Uh, again, setting up vehicles, setting up system testing. and. Uh, this uh, team has done a fantastic job of uh, putting together this information. I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of it. Thank you all. Um, I'm excited to kind of get initially your guys's reaction to this idea of the skill sets that are needed by technicians and kind of what role they play. So maybe as you guys can popcorn around and share you know, what skill sets um, are most critical for your company with your technicians? Working in the prototype development with um, multiple companies that are doing development work in, in the uh, connected vehicle arena, uh, we find that we need technicians that have mechanical skill and a higher and growing degree of electrical electronics background, but we're also starting to learn now that if, if a technician has even some homegrown uh, computer networking experience, that's very helpful in implementing and integrating these equipment packages into the automotive market. And having that background in automotive helps with understanding the durability of what this equipment needs to be and how we can install it to make it survive our Michigan roads. Yes, I can jump in here. Um, I uh, actually reached out to some of my uh, previous interns to uh, ask them to reflect back uh, when they first joined our team and uh, kind of reiterate the, the needs for, and you've covered quite a few of them, but um, one of the ones that stood out the most um, was CAN. Um, so some, some preparation speaking to the uh, education community that uh, there'd be a really high value on, a, on, on some classes, understanding automotive can, and maybe some collaboration with the vector tools to get some exposure to some of their hardware and tools that they provide to the auto industry would really get 
um, you know, the future uh, technicians and and even uh, pre-engineering uh, associates prepared. Uh, but that's one. Um, another one that came to mind was uh, in the electrical area, uh, wiring harness skills. So again, in, you know, a uh, thought would be to, uh, during their education, have a class where there's a building a wiring harness or a breakout harness for some module in the car. Maybe they get to pick it or maybe the instructor picks it. But uh, that would give them the exposure of wiring diagrams, uh, crimping, perhaps soldering, and, and planning, and, and, and so forth. So those are, those are two ideas that came to mind on my side. I reached out to the technician I have an autonomous drive, and specifically he has an electrical background and has some really good mechanical skills. And like your data showed in your presentation, that's obviously the, two, the part of the foundation. But I specifically asked him, you know, what would you like to have more training in? <clears throat> you talked about radar functions. Um, obviously the CAN that was just mentioned by Marty, but then you started talking about, you know, the, understanding the automotive ethernet better as well. It's a much faster form of communication protocol. So those are two items that he would like to have in addition to what he currently has under his belt. He does this work daily. He's one of our, he's our key member from the technician side. And yeah, I'll reiterate, I think the vehicle communication side that has been brought up is, is critical. Um, I, love, I think also adding in the offboard aspect because of a lot, a lot of the, the vehicle is going to be communicating with offboard systems, especially in the connected car area and the autonomous drive area. Um, so having some understanding of uh, network um, communication as well, the offboard aspect, I think would be uh, very valuable for the next generation. Some of those enhanced skills that we're talking about. I know, Sarah, that you brought up mechatronics earlier and, and not to elaborate too far on mechatronics, but um, most educational systems are looking for a two or four year degree in mechatronics. And a lot of the skills that we need are not uh, a requirement of having an actual degree, but having enough knowledge of that system to bolster that knowledge with experiential uh, work in the industry because in a lot of instances, the industry is moving faster than the educational system is. And it's hard to develop those instructions uh, to present to a student before that new uh, technology has already come and gone or come and been developed into something new again. Uh, so a gross understanding is not completely necessary, but a base understanding of these technologies so that a person can get into the field and then learn from whoever their employer is how that specific system works and and then work toward the integration of that system. Um, and previously within this team, we've talked about uh, the combination of different educational backgrounds that we might be looking for, even into the engineering portions of, of the development sector in that uh, it used to be that a mechanical engineer was uh, the most populous engineering degree in the automotive market. And now that's not necessarily the case. We need an engineer that has uh, computer engineering and uh, systems engineering and materials engineering, as well as the mechanical engineering and electrical engineering that goes with it, because all of those systems are working together. They're not uh, the separate systems that they used to be in 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. Thank you all. That's really helpful perspective to kind of understand, um, you know, kind of the starting point and where you see things going right now, for sure. Um, Parker, did you want to lead us into some questions? I did uh, get a question um, in Q&A that I think you've sort of been touching on. And, and John has asked about um, a situation with software developers who did not necessarily have mechanical, electrical, electronic experience skills. But he's wondering if there won't be a substantial class of jobs that might require high level programming capabilities if something like that might emerge and would there, and I'm paraphrasing him, um, you know, might there be um, a path for someone to do this kind of work that doesn't necessarily require the MEE background is a workforce development for someone who brings those sort of programming skills. So 
I would, I would think yes. Um, I, I think they would still need some of the basic skills, um, as Marty mentioned, to be able to build harnesses because um, the, um, from our standpoint, we utilize a lot of bench building and we share them with outside suppliers as well um, to support uh, validation. Um, and we do require um, software development in order to uh, make these benches work. So I think there is a, an area in which that potential is there, but I still think some of the base understanding of building a bench would still be required. And I would expand that into the integration of systems into a vehicle, because as you integrate these systems into a vehicle, there may or may not be a full understanding, even by the engineering team, of how those components are going to interact together. And a coder at end of line uh, looking at the raw data coming from these sensory that are installed in these vehicles uh, and understanding what those signals mean uh, and how to make calibration adjustments to display what that data means to somebody that can understand it fully uh, is going to be important and is important currently in the in the prototype development market uh, as we as we build prototypes and put them out there on the road we have to make them uh, functional or commission them before they go out on on the road for testing and we do have uh, software engineers and, and uh, coders that do work on that type of work. Yes, I'll chime in here as well. I had a team of engineering students, um, basically individuals who were on their way to get their four-year degree and working with, uh, working with us at Bosch on uh, internships, getting exposure to the auto industry. And we found um, a lot of internal projects where we could take advantage of those um, programming skills and give them exposure to a project of their own that wasn't necessarily as critical as, as a full automotive build that would be an internal project. So I would say the, the, the individuals that come in with some, some software skills or programming skills that are at the beginning level are, are, are very useful um, on a team. I mean, individually, uh, if it was a one-man band, they, they need to have all or a good amount of the skills. But if it's a part of a team, you could have a specialist who has uh, a young specialist who has some skills in, in software and programming that could uh, enhance that team's capabilities. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question uh, to ask, and I think you've... Uh, You've talked a little bit about the soft skills, and and that seems to be important. If you if you could add anything um, about how you think the soft skills are important for these tactical worlds, because that seems to be an important element that's missing, maybe a little bit undefined, but uh, sort of critical um, to being able to best leverage the tactical capabilities that you'd like the middle skill workforce to have. And I'm and I'm kind of inserting that question because I've had another question come in that um, you. Know, with addressing that one, I'd like to ask another question that an audience member has. I can uh, speak to that. Like, you know, the most important one would be integrity. You know, it's going down like communication, simple courtesy, responsibility, and personal skills, professionalism, positive attitude, teamwork skills. It's already been mentioned. And um, the communication, how it's so important is, you know, you're working directly with the engineering staff and you're going to have issues, you're going to have things that we follow the standard or uh, things didn't go right. Somebody missed them. Didn't use a piece of equipment correctly. We're going to have to do a, a use the 8D methodology, the 5Y methodology to do the root cause analysis. Why did it happen? Why didn't we detect it? And we need the technician to be able to explain that. And, and sometimes, you know, that's in a on the floor at the gimba, or it could be in, in a, a conference room setting with upper management. We need the technicians to be comfortable in their own skin and have that skill set of good uh, verbal communication. Obviously, it goes without saying the written communication, and then the flexibility. Paul mentioned about, you know, the background it used to be like you know, straight up mechanical engineering is preferred. Obviously, that's a key need, but the flexibility, even in our workforce, we have a, we call it a flexing our staff, but we have to put our manpower where the work is at. And as the um, new pr models come in, new projects come in, we, we may need to take somebody out of uh, the ADAS department for a period of time and let them train and work in materials lab. They have to be flexible and understand the bigger picture. That's very important. And obviously, uh, last but not least, a strong work ethic. I think yeah, I would, yeah. I like what Ben said about uh, all the different 
aspects of the soft skills uh, and employing those soft skills is the most important part in gathering the capability of a technician because as you're working a development vehicle, uh, we all know now that all the components still come from someplace right here in the United States. You may be communicating with Germany in the morning and China in the afternoon and someplace in the mid Middle East uh, at the end of the day uh, and trying to understand how all these things come together. So communication skills with the technician are uh, hugely important in the current market and moving forward, it's gonna be increasingly more important because technicians are gonna be working directly with engineering staff on a daily basis to understand these systems and to troubleshoot the systems. And the technician needs to be able to uh, describe what he's seeing in his troubleshooting steps and in some instances, those troubleshooting matrices that are existent for the automotive market today that are available online don't exist yet for a CAV type vehicle. So a lot of technicians are working with engineering staffs to develop those troubleshooting skills and uh, direction so that when we do run into a new issue that nobody's seen yet, we can write a, a descriptive that can walk someone that is completely ignorant of the system through it and help them to troubleshoot it and repair it. Yeah, I'd piggyback that and say communication style that is effective is key. There's numerous ways to communicate. Some of the traditional ways that we're used to, of course, is uh, telephone, texting, email. Um, but the next generation is using different methods to communicate and different styles and, and, and different philosophy on communication. Um, you know, I might expect a, a response in a certain amount of time in a certain way, and, and someone else from a different generation would, ha would have different expectations in mind. So it's, uh, as Ben mentioned, flexibility, being able to um, communicate in a cross-generational way that's effective. Um, and the second point, um, I don't have the answer to that question other than that's, that's a statement that, that has to uh, be understood by the uh, up and coming workforce that they really need to get uh, how important it is to communicate in an effective way. Um, and the second point is um, documentation. That's, that, that is so key. Um, being able to um, document in detail and make it a habit of documenting in detail um, what you're going to do, what you've done, uh, what you're working on. Um, th those are probably the two weakest areas that I've seen in, in my team members uh, as they're coming in and getting mentored and, and uh, growing into the role. And for me, um, a lot of uh, redundancy here, but um, the three that I look for both in my engineering team and my technician team is um, to work cross-functionally, which I think was uh, brought up by Paul. You may be talking with you know, Japan at one point, you may be talking with Germany, but to work um, with suppliers, with, with, with other engineers, with other teams um, within your area. So cross-functional work. Um, Communication, which is obviously a big one that's been brought up by everybody, um, but communicating with transparency. Um, I think Marty's point about documenting is, is, a, is a critical skill. And then finally, the, uh, the learner aspect, as, as Paul did bring up, you know, things change so quickly. that I think it is critical that um, the, the person have a curious mindset, that, that they want to be a learner. Um, they're going to have to because things change so quickly. Um, and one other thing, maybe not such a soft skill, but uh, the ability to think critically um, about certain situations, um, as opposed to being just task oriented, um, being able to analyze that task and determine one way or the other, whether, whether it was a success, success, whether it was a failure, you know, provide some insight in, um, into the, the situation. Hey, thank you. Um, now, sort of a uh, segue in thinking about like learner resources and, you, you know, you, you mentioned lifelong learning and the, the different skills people need to pick up. And um, I have a question here from uh, Brian, who works at U of M Center for Academic Innovation. And he was ask, actually asking, um, they develop MOOCs, the online courses for training um, that cover a wide span of disciplines in engineering, soft skills and other areas. And he's curious 
what types of university content should they encourage faculty to prioritize um, or develop a repurpose to help fill some of the gaps that you've been mentioning? So what, what sort of um, online MOOC training do you think might be useful to address some of these needs? Or do you think, um, and, and I could also add, do you think the online training seems like it could be a very valuable part of answering some of these training needs? So you, do you see a, a good training method there in having sort of an online and in-person hybrid type of training to help your employees? Can that be a resource for them? That's a tough question because we're talking about technicians and most technicians learn better hands-on than they do online. But looking at an online mo model for presenting this information, uh, if we can present uh, in snippets, uh, we've mentioned CAN, uh, we've also mentioned wiring harness assembly, uh, we've mentioned bench building, uh, and, and basically building uh, prototypes for a first time run. If, if there can be a course that's developed that teaches the the base skills for accomplishing those tasks and then provides uh, scenario uh, solutions to force that student to now troubleshoot what they've learned uh, online. If, if you can teach them online what the system is, how it operates, and then simulate a troubleshooting session through a scenario, uh, it, would, it would solidify that information in the technician's mind and help them to it apply it later when they actually get back to the to the shop or plant floor and, and are expected to utilize that new skill. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question that we were thinking about before this um, event that we've seen so many of our companies dealing with is um, how COVID is impacting the potential skills that people might need on the job. Has that been something that's been impacting your workplace and are there any specific skills do you think that have surfaced or that have become you know, more apparent or more needed in, in this kind of environment that, that wasn't the case before? I'll speak to that. <clears throat> um, you know, we deemed our, our business is deemed critical. Um, a lot of our engineers working from home with the test lab continues to supply, uh, provide testing and, and provide the data. You know, I would say the biggest skills is, it's already been mentioned is reiterate is the flexibility and um, the integrity. I mean, it's, we may be on this for quite some time. Who knows? It could be a year from now. I heard yesterday that Google is going to keep their employees home for the next year, but that's not a, an option for us, but the integrity of um, understanding um, your working for yourself. We hear it in the news every single day, but I think it's just the flexibility and the integrity is, is, is do what you need to do. And it's never been a problem. You don't have to machine shop and have them put safety glasses or a face shield or make sure you're not working. You know, you have your, if you have a long hair, you have it tied up. If you're working with a lathe or something like that, just, just be flexible and adapt to the environment and be thankful that we're still working. And it's a, everybody that's not, it's, it's a definitely, it shows it's a definitely a critical job and it's a good job. I think to echo some of what Ben said, but also add uh, that with engineers and management staff, a lot of them working from home, it leaves the technician uh, on the shop floor a lot of times by himself. So it forces him into the communications that he may or may not be comfortable with. And it also forces him to make decisions that he wouldn't routinely make in a, in a day to day occurrence in his own job. He's going to assume what the engineer uh, would ask him to do and maybe confirm that with the engineer before he proceeds, but it makes him think outside of himself and what his standard skill set might be and, and forces him to, uh, to use a, a standard phrase, stretch his legs a little bit and, and stretch himself into some skills that maybe he's not 100% comfortable with, but knows enough to get the job done. Yeah, I would say from my experience uh, during this uh, COVID, I was back in the labs pretty quickly and found it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a repeat here. Uh, communication and documentation were, were critical uh, to keep the, the information, the accurate information 
shared back and forth with the engineering community and the technicians. So uh, again, whatever whatever style or, or method that works uh, for what, whoever's involved, um, it, it just needs to be very proactive. And again, documentation, there's, there's all kinds of ways to document things. Uh, there's creative ways. Uh, everybody's got a phone in their hands. So they're taking pictures and, and sharing that or FaceTime or all kinds of different methods of uh, communication that, that weren't the traditional methods uh, that I spent you know, decades doing. So it's communication, documentation uh, flowed to the top for me. And so some, some personal experience with the, uh, the infotainment team, the team that I came from, um, many of the uh, technicians are working ho from home with a, with a vehicle. And we're finding that actually they're, because of the lack of interruption and such, they are, they're actually more efficient and they're finding new ways of communication to, you know, if we need supplier support, you know, using WhatsApp to communicate um, and meet maybe in a parking lot so that the, the, the supplier can take a log of maybe an issue that has been found. So the COVID has definitely stretched the capabilities of, of the technicians and, and challenged their integrity, as Ben has said, um, and to challenge them to, to get more work done or to, to get the same amount of work done. Um, but under these new circumstances, and, and we're finding that um, they're, they're very efficient. Um, they're actually finding more issues with, through software validation and such that, are, that is helping us to clean up some issues prior to launches. Um, so it's actually been a, 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 you know, funny to say a positive experience during this, this, this time, but um, it, it opened some eyes. Mm. So the challenge has created new opportunities to try new things and learn. So that's interesting. Yes. Um, so maybe uh, one final question that I could add um, that might be a, a good way to, to uh, come to the end of the Q&A here is, you know, looking at the next five years, what are you most concerned about or maybe what are you optimistic about as it relates to the middle skill employees? Um, what do you think the next five years looks like? what might the key challenges be? You've sort of been talking about those things already, um, but how would you maybe characterize that looking forward to where do you think we might be in that, you know, five years from now, that kind of period? I'll jump in here and say the, the biggest challenge that I foresee in five years is the, is the uh, finding the talent and acquiring the talent. There's gonna be talent out there, um, but my uh, counterparts here on the screen are going to be trying to steal them from me and I'm going to be trying to steal them from them. And uh, that's going to be the biggest challenge is the, uh, the resources that are out there is, is uh, getting them and keeping them and, uh, you know, keeping them up, up to speed with all the, all the things they need. Yeah, I would echo that. There, there's a book by uh, Jim Collins called Good to Great, getting the right people on the bus and then make sure you have the right seat. Um, that's a challenge um, with the, full-time, the mix of full-time staff and contract staff, you never um, can um, look down on somebody for trying to better themselves. And there's only a certain amount of full-time positions you have in the, the ebbs and flow of the market. And um, it's a definitely a challenge. I think one thing is too, is when we finally get, you know, we, I shouldn't say finally, when we get the right people, we get a lot of, a lot of great people come in the door, some of them are siloed into what they really like and want to do. And i mentioned it earlier, but that flexibility is so key. I mean, your passion might be electrical, but you might need to work in the, you know, the more mechanical side of things, or maybe turning wrenches on a, a chassis bed plate for a period of time and keeping that uh, positive energy. That's one of the challenges. And I think that um, my generation, and you have to, you have to adapt, you know, I have to adapt my management style, but um, we, we have fun with it sometimes in the lab, but you know, a lot of time my generation, we tearing dirt bikes apart or, um, working on tractors or whatever, and then school is kind of affirmation of things we kind of already were doing. And we have some of the younger generation that come in and they're, they're brainiacs. They run circles around me on the tech side of things, but some of the things that we take for granted, they may have never seen before. Um, they never did tear down their own vehicle and put it back together. So that's important for us as a team to figure out how to uh, merge that and make sure we're keeping the staff we have, when we do get them in the door, keeping them motivated and sustain them. I think from a, from a perspective of the people that have been in the market for 20 or 30 years, uh, we recognize that a lot of things have changed in the educational market. And 
a lot of shop classes and the hands-on learning that used to be in the schools is no longer. Uh, shop classes have gone away, mechanics classes have gone away, fabrication and welding. Um, they're, they're career tech centers in a lot of places, but a lot of those schools, the individual schools that used to have those, and they had talented, um, we'll say the older adult educators that were there that had all of that hands-on experience that they had learned uh, were able to present that to their students and that a lot of that is not uh, available to the students anymore. And that's what creates the, the students that Ben has alluded to that are brainiacs that run in circles around us on the tech side and, and doing math calculations and things like that. But when it comes to how do I get the engine out of that vehicle over there or how do I create a bracket to mount this module on the fender well, they can't imagine how they would accomplish that. They, they assume that they have to have a specialist to do that. And I would assume that most of the guys and gals on this screen have done those things in the past. And we found that we needed a bracket and we just went over to the fab shop and made one. Uh, and and the, the new skilled technicians that are coming in are very siloed. They know their area and that's what they wanna work in. And it's our job to figure out how to entertain them and, and lure them to these things that they don't know anything about and try and get them excited about it and make them into uh, full, full-fledged technicians, not just an electrical technician or not just a mechanical technician, but somebody that's a prototype technician or a full systems technician that can go into any area of the vehicle, make a repair, make an installation, and, and keep things moving. And for me, yeah, I'll, I'll be short. I think uh, based on your presentation, sir, I think the, uh, for me, the, in the next five years, it's going to be those enhanced skills, um, including maybe security. Those, um, the, the base is obviously very important. As Paul said, we, we, we need the people to be able to fabricate things, you know, to, but we can't have necessarily just silo. There has to be the flexibility that Ben was talking about. And, um, but in the next five years, I think the data area, the software area, the cybersecurity area, that area is, is, is going to be key. Great. Thank you all. Parker, are there any last minute um, questions? Um, a few more just came in. Um, one is asking if um, our presenters, if their companies have apprenticeship programs. And it's, let's see, we have one more here. Oh, and a comment from Macomb Community College about some of the programming that they have available. Um, includes automotive electronics, cybersecurity, embedded programming, networking. Um, so that comment should be available to everybody they want to see. That's from um, Macomb Community College. But the remaining question is about, that we could put to the panel, would be about the apprenticeship programs. I'll try to jump in first. Yes, we have quite a few uh, programs available in different areas. So um, Bosch, just, just Google Bosch jobs and, and there's lots of opportunities. Unfortunately, at the moment, they're limited because of the COVID and, and, and um, we, we had quite a few uh, perspectives that were gonna join us, but they're on hold. But in the very near future, hopefully that'll open back up. That'd be the, the same for Nissan. It's, it's on hold right now, but um, look at Nissan jobs. You can do, we work through hire through Kelly services. We have several co-op uh, students as well. So we do have those. And Roush does as well. We have a, a fairly deep program of, of engineering students, high school students, um, and cross trainers, people coming in from other industries and other markets that want to learn about the automotive industry. So we have uh, from engineering down to technician from engineering up to management level. Great. All right. Well, we're getting close to noon, so I want to go ahead and wrap us up. Um, thank you to our industry panelists so much for your insights that you provided today. I really hope and I know that this helped provide um, future uh, further perspective on what the research said. So I really appreciate that. Um, for all the attendees, I will be emailing out um, the report and the recording so that you can view that. Um, my contact email will be in there. If you have additional questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I can try to connect you. 
um, if you have questions for any of our industry representatives, I can toss that out to them as well. So again, really appreciate everyone's time today. And um, thank you for uh, just giving us this morning. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.